Good morning. Good morning. What a beautiful morning the Lord has made today. The sun's out. Beautiful. Shining out. Summertime's coming. Hot Oh, y'all aren't looking forward to 100 degrees and 100 percent humidity? <laughs> I know you're not, Brother Earl, are you? <laughs> oh, God. Brother Clayton, I know he's not. Oh, God is good, though. Amen. Amen. So good to have Brother David Moore here visiting with us and ministering here shortly. And I uh, look forward to maybe hearing a little more about his trip to Africa and what uh, what he has seen in the body of Christ that you and I typically we don't see. And I uh, look forward to his report on that. And those of you that are joining us at home, <coughs> we just encourage you to just worship with us this morning. Wherever in the world you may be, just worship with us. That's why we've assembled here. That's why that camera is on, is that the body of Christ may come together in one accord and just worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. I know there is needs in this house. I know there is needs wherever in the world that you're receiving this signal. The Lord would tell Joshua this from the very first chapter recorded in the book of Joshua. The Lord would say, have not I commanded you, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wheresoever you go. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Wherever you go, wherever you go, Whatever you do, whatever you're going through or going to go through, whether the valley of the shadow of death that we were walking through or you're on the mountaintop, the Lord is with us. So whatever your, your need is this morning, whether in the sanctuary or at home, I'm here to tell you, our God is able. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come together, this resident church that you have assembled by the blood of Christ, to come together to praise you, to worship you in spirit and in truth, to magnify you in our hearts. And Lord, that we should grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Father, we, we yield ourselves unto thee, to thy spirit. We ask for the Holy Spirit to move and to, to come and just Lord, as we partake this morning of the river of life of Christ, we just ask for the Holy Spirit to just douse us. Lord, to just envelop us, O oh Lord, with thy spirit. We ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And all of God's children said, Amen. 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 Let's stand and praise the Lord this morning. How many know one day there's going to be a meeting in the air? Right? Yes, sir. But till then, I love meeting down here, don't you? <laughs> well, there's going to be
long time ago. Some point I had to get my mind made up, but I was kind of wishy washy at first. I've been out in the world so much, and, and I got to thinking about I played myself one time before, the way I was, and hold myself accountable. You let me know one day he said it all the more counts. <laughs> hey, they're not held against me anymore. Well, there was a time on earth when in the book of
Come on, church. Whatever you brought in here with you, lay it down. Amen. And just let God bless you. He cares about each and every one of us. Amen. Don't sit here.
Father, thank you for the fellowship that we have with you and with one another. Father, we just ask that you would visit us in a special way. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in this time, that your name would be high and lifted up. For you said, Lord God, in your word, that if you be high and lifted up, that you would draw all men unto yourself. And Lord, we just want to be drawn a little bit closer to you, a little bit greater relationship with you, Heavenly Father. Lord, that you be glorified, that you be magnified. We say it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise God. Good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. 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 Well, maybe one or two of you uh, <laughs> be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Yeah, some days, you know, you just got to get the prime the pump a little bit more than others. You know? <laughs> That's just the way it goes. That's humanity. Amen. I want to share just a little bit. Uh, most of you know that... Uh, uh, that I had gone to uh, Tanzania uh, for a couple of weeks, and I just want to just share very briefly a little bit about that uh, that particular trip. And uh, we just we had a, a wonderful time of ministry to the people there, and uh, hungry people, hungry people uh, over there in, in countries such as that, third world countries, um, people that don't have. Uh, quite what we have, uh, but they have a, a desperation and, and a hunger for the Lord. And, uh, and we had the opportunity to minister in some uh, two of the uh, remote villages uh, there in Tanzania. We had to drive, one of them we had to drive, uh, it was only about an hour and a half, I think, an hour and a half, two hours to get to this particular village. And uh, I mean, these people, many of them had never even seen a white man before. And that's how remote that it was. That one, not in particular, the one that we had to drive a couple hours to. One of them we had to drive, we drove up in what they call the up country, um, which would be what we refer to as the boonies. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was about a seven hour drive. And uh, when I tell you that uh, the type of lifestyle that they live, we, we just don't even know, we, we can't even comprehend it. It's something that we've never experienced. Um, uh, even, even just a, 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 normal, <coughs> we would, a normal toilet is not normal there. I mean, they, it's literally a hole in the ground. That's what you have and that's it. And, uh, but the ministry was just incredible. Uh, we saw people get saved, people baptized with the Holy Spirit, people ministered to, edified, blessed, strengthened, uh, encouraged. One particular altar call, I think just about everybody in the church came forward. There were about 150 people. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I, I made the altar call and I had them come up and, and everyone came up. And I was thinking to myself, because I was exhausted, I had preached, or this is one of the last services, I believe. And I was exhausted, and uh, I thought, oh my goodness, i got to pray for all of these people. And uh, But the Lord gave me grace, and I got some help, of course, with uh, some of the other leadership there. But uh, but it was a great time, a uh, great time of ministry. And I uh, don't know if I'll be going back anytime soon after uh, two days of flying there, and literally two days of flying back. Uh, we estimated on the way back that we were literally on the airplane for 32 hours on an airplane. <laughs> and we had found out that we had taken the most indirect route that you could possibly take to Tanzania. Because it was the cheapest flight, so they just, I mean, it was ping pong and all over, you know, the African continent, and it was just crazy. Uh, so anyhow, it was, it was intense, but it was well worth it. Amen. I want us to turn our Bibles to uh, uh, the book of Lamentations. I'm just really going to read one verse uh, to kind of springboard into what I want to share with you this morning, what I feel the Lord has put upon my heart. I'm going to share with you something uh, very personal, something that I have personally experienced uh, and gone through and hope that it will uh, certainly uh, challenge some of you, bless, encourage, strengthen, some of you as well as the Lord ministered this to me. 
Bible says in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 25, it says, The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. Let me read that again. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. Good unto those who wait for him. What does it mean to, uh, to wait upon the Lord? What does it mean to wait upon the Lord? You know, I always had this mindset when I was a young Christian that waiting upon the Lord, you go and you lock yourself in a room and you spend an hour or two hours or whatever it may be, uh, and you just sort of meditate uh, on the Lord, and that you know constituted waiting on the Lord. And there is some truth to that, and there are times that the Lord will uh, lead us to do that for a period of time, whatever it is for you. Know, Lord might want you to go and fast and lock yourself in a room and wait on Him in that regard. Uh, but I began to realize as I, uh, through experience and through uh, studying this out and understanding what that word wait uh, actually means, um, if, if you were to look it up in, a, in a, just a, a, a simple concordance, it would say this, it would be, it would say to wait on, to wait upon, or to wait for, to wait on, to wait upon, to wait for. Um, using the analogy, I think one commentator I read after uh, one time used this analogy of a waiter at a restaurant. I don't think they call them waiters anymore, I think they call them servers. I don't know, probably some political thing that you can't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to make a separation between waiters and waitresses, I don't know, so they're all servers but anyhow uh, that's what they are they're waiters uh, when you are in that profession they would say I wait tables all right meaning that you tend to this is the idea here this is the uh, the illustration or the analogy of how that that applies to waiting on the Lord when, when there when you go to a restaurant and there is a good waiter or waitress or server, <laughs> They are conscious of what you have need of at that table. Uh, if you need a drink, if you have to have plates removed that you've, you know, you've already eaten and you have empty plates, and, uh, uh, and they are to be a good waiter or waitress, will be aware of and in tune with what is going on at your particular table. Amen. How many of you have had good waiters and you've had bad waiters? Oh, yeah. I mean, you got plates piled up and you want your tea refilled and, and you don't get it for you know for an hour and you get frustrated and uh, that would not be a good waiter. Uh, but someone that is a good waiter or waitress, they would be attentive to what is taking place at your particular table and what the needs are. So in the same way, us waiting upon the Lord, meaning that we are attentive to and sensitive to and conscious of constantly what God wants, what God desires, what God, and I know this may sound strange, what God needs. God doesn't need anything from us per se, but we, uh, we are to bless Him. We are to worship Him. Uh, and it's just being in touch and in tune with the Heavenly Father. And that's the idea there. But also it means this, and this is one of the most powerful uh, meanings of, of that word wait, or the idea of waiting upon the Lord, is one of the definitions or meanings in the original language is this, to bind together by twisting. That's what, that's what it says. To bind together by twisting. The idea, if you could, if you could imagine this, illustration or analogy of a rope that is uh, strength a rope is a is strands of literally strings that are bound and wound together and depending upon how strong you want that rope to be will uh, be determined upon how many strands of string uh, that are tied and wound and bound together so that is a very powerful uh, analogy, a very powerful illustration of what waiting on the Lord is. It's the idea of being, and maybe you've sung this song before, of being wrapped up, tied up, all tangled up, 
in Jesus. You ever heard that song? Maybe you've sung it. I don't know. Maybe you've heard it. No? No? Yes. A couple? Two, three? All right. See, I'm, I've got a tough crowd here this morning. So, I'm going to apply for so the idea of being wrapped up, tied up, tangled all up in the Lord, meaning the idea of intimacy, relationship, nearness, that you are bound together with Him. All right? That is the idea of waiting upon the Lord. And it's not something that we would do just for an hour or two hours or a day. But the idea in the Word of God is this to be a lifestyle for us. That we are to live a lifestyle of waiting upon the Lord. Being in tune, being uh, uh, sensitive to and in line with and, and understanding and desiring, God, what do you want done right now? God, what do you need to be accomplished? Lord, uh, I am uh, binding myself together with you. I'm entering into intimacy and relationship with you. That's what Christianity, you see, is all about. And that which is... What Christianity is, being all about that intimacy and relationship, we as believers, many times, we fall away from that. Very subtly, not intentionally, but we can leave that. It's the idea, if you will, and I, I may have preached on this recently, but the idea of leaving your first love. Uh, Jesus addressing that church uh, in Ephesus, uh, if you can think about it this way, look at it this way, that this church was a church that they were doing everything right, they were serving God, they were ministering. Uh, Jesus would say this, you've labored for me. Uh, you don't tolerate false apostles. You don't tolerate false teaching and false doctrine. In other words, you're living the Christian life. You're doing the Christian things. You are busy about whatever your particular ministry or vocation, what you do as a Christian. It may be a singer. It may be a worship leader. You're faithful to do that. You are faithful to lead people into the presence of God. But you may fall into that category. You may be the pastor. You may be the preacher like me. And you are preaching messages and leading people into the presence of God and teaching people the Word of God and exhorting them and edifying them and even seeing results, people getting saved, baptized with the Holy Spirit, getting blessed, edified, and encouraged in the Lord, but you may fall into that category of having left your first love. That's a very uh, alarming thing for us as believers. Something that we have to be very, very aware of. All right, We can forget that what this Christian walk is all about. What this thing is all about. It's not just about your victory. It's not just about your peace, your joy, your blessing. What you have as a Christian. And don't get me wrong. God will bless you. God will give you joy and peace and victory over sin and all of these things when we serve Him right. But that's not what it's all about. Do you know the reason why Jesus died on that cross? The main reason why Jesus died on that cross is not really about you. First of all, it's all about us glorifying Him. But secondly, and most importantly, the only way that we can glorify Him is to be brought back into relationship with Him. That's why He died for you. Amen. Not just so that you can be blessed and have nice stuff or have a nice life or whatever. The things that I've mentioned, as wonderful and biblical as they are, having joy and peace and, and victory over sin, sometimes we just we, we preach those things and we teach those things as, as if that is the end goal for you as a believer, but ultimately the end goal for you as a believer is to glorify Him and to be brought back into intimacy and relationship with the Heavenly Father. Right. Right. 
that you may walk with him as Adam and Eve did in the cool of the day. See, that's what that's why Jesus died for you, so that that relationship that God had with humanity, with Adam and Eve, so that we could be restored back to that. Remember, they walked with him. A simple life. They just walked in relationship with the Heavenly Father. But what separated them, of course, it was sin. They committed sin. They they disobeyed God. And, and you know the story. They tried to uh, cover themselves with fig leaves. And, and God said, no, 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 that's not going to cut it. I cannot look on you because you have sinned and you've rebelled against me. So he slayed an animal and clothed them with the skins of, the, of, of an animal, that being the type of the Lamb of God that would be slain, the sacrifice, so that God now could enter back into relationship with us, his creatures, that which he created us for, so that we could have intimate relationship with him as our heavenly father and we as his sons and his daughters as children of the living God. That's what this is all about, folks. You walking with Jesus. You being restored back to being reconciled. Remember, Paul would talk about the ministry of reconciliation. That first, that we must be reconciled back to God. You know what it means to be reconciled? It means to be brought back into harmony with God. It means to be brought back into, and don't be offended by this, into friendship with God. Some people, you know, they get offended by that. They say, oh, you know, I'm a friend of God. Well, that, that's disrespecting the Heavenly Father. And He's so far above. We know that He's so far above. He's the Creator. But He desires in the Lord Jesus Christ to be friends with you, if you will. That type of relationship. That's what reconciliation is. You being brought back into harmony with God and brought back into friendship with God. That is what this is all about. Amen. And what we have to be careful as Christians, all right? All right, this is going to be a little, um, you know, going <laughs> to spank you around a little bit. So, you know, just fasten your sheepbell. Because just about every one of us fall into this category. And I'm going to share something with you in a moment that puts me in the same boat. Is that we find ourselves going through the motions of Christianity. Going through the motions of uh, performing and doing what God has called us to do. Not only in ministry, but just in our everyday lives it becomes just checking off a box, doing the Christian disciplines, whatever it may be. And that is a, it's something that happens very subtly, very subtly. Um, I want to read just a few. We see many places in the, in the book of Psalms. I'm going to read several uh, places here in Psalms where it refers to waiting on God and the importance of this, all right? Uh, David would say this in Psalm 25, 3. He would say, Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Psalm 25, 5, he says, Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. So we see this many times in Scripture. For in thee do I wait all the day. Psalm 25, 21, let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Remember, keep in mind that definition of waiting on the Lord. You're developing, you're waiting on him, you're, you're uh, establishing and developing and maintaining relationship and intimacy this is every time david says that wait 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 on the lord that's what he's saying don't lose that intimacy don't lose that relationship that for which god paid such a great price psalm 3 33 20 our soul wait for the lord he is our help and our shield psalm 37 7 rest in the lord and wait patiently for him Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in his way. 
Psalm 37, 9. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. That idea of inheriting the earth, it means just inheriting the land or the promised land. The promised land of blessing. You see, you have a promised land to live in. It's not heaven. All right, that is the ultimate promised land. But the promised land for you is walking in that vast spiritual land of liberty and freedom and blessing that there is for you as a child of God. So notice that, how powerful that is. Waiting on the Lord so that you will inherit the land. All right, that promised land. Psalm 37, 34. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. Again, Psalm 37 or 39, 7. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Psalm 40 and 1. Uh, a psalm of David, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. One more. I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it, and I will wait on thy name. So we see in several places, and that's just a few, where we see uh, David exhorting and instructing with the idea of waiting upon the Lord. Recently, I, I have been going through, uh, I want to share something, I can pull it up here. Something that I, I have experienced personally, this is what really uh, impressed upon me to, to share what I'm sharing with you uh, here today. I experienced something over the last several months and I couldn't put my finger on it. I found myself to be uh, frustrated. I found myself to be discontented. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't figure out what was going on. Lord, why am I feeling this way? It seemed that in everything that I was doing, there was a discontentment there was a, a sense of frustration, and I was, you know, and I would say to the Lord, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything that I normally do, all right? I'm checking off those boxes. I get up in the morning, and I read my Bible, and I have my prayer time. I do all of that. I'm, I'm very disciplined with all of that. I'm traveling all over. I'm preaching the gospel. Uh, I'm maintaining faithfully my responsibilities uh, with my family, with my wife, and whatever my responsibilities are at home. I mean, I'm doing everything that I normally do. Lord, why am I frustrated? Why is there discontentment within my heart? And I got to a place where it really got to the point where I was like, Lord, I don't even know if I want to do this anymore. I don't even know if I even want to preach anymore because I just I feel unfulfilled. I feel that uh, I, I just I couldn't even I couldn't even explain why I felt the way that I felt. And every morning I read. There's a couple of devotionals that I read. I read Brother Swaggart's uh, devotional, The Word for Every Day. And there's another one that I read called The Streams in the Desert. Streams in the desert, and I, I picked it up that day, that morning, uh, and, and again, I was in the midst of this frustrated state, Lord, what is going on? And I read, I read this story, and I want to read it to you, just follow along, I wish I was a good storyteller, but I'm not, so I'm going to read this, uh, this story to you, uh, just listen very carefully, well, I see I'm having a hard time with everybody being focused, so just focus if you can, just for a few moments. The story is told of a shabby old gentleman who every day at 12 o'clock would enter the church. He would stay a few minutes and then he would leave. The caretaker was concerned for the valuable uh, altar furnishings. Every day he watched to be sure nothing was taken. And every day just at 12, the shabby figure would arrive. One day the care caretaker accosted him. He said, look here, my friend, what are you up to going into the church every day? 
And he replied, he says, I go to pray. The old man said politely. Now come, the cautious caretaker said. You don't stay long enough to pray. True enough, I cannot pray a long prayer, but every day I just come and I say, Jesus, it's Jim. That was his name, Jim, there you go. <coughs> Jesus, it's Jim. Then I wait a minute, then I go away. I guess he hears me, though it is but a little prayer. One day Jim was knocked down crossing the street. Oh boy, these electronic things, you know, things come up and go away. One day Jim was knocked down crossing the street and was laid up in the hospital with a broken leg. The ward where Jim quite happily lay was a sore spot to the nurses on duty. Some of the men were cross and miserable. Others did nothing but grumble from morning till night. Slowly but surely, the men stopped their grumbling and were cheerful and contented. One day, as the nurse was walking through the ward, she heard the men laughing. What has happened to all of you, she said. You are such a cheerful lot of patients lately. And they said, it's old Jim, they replied. He's always cheerful, never complains, although he is uncomfortable and in pain. The nurse walked over to Jim's bed where the silvery-haired Jim lay with an angelic look on his smiling face. Well, Jim, these men say that you are the cause for the change in this ward. They say that you are always happy. Ah, he said, that I am, nurse. He said, I can't help it. You see, nurse, it's my visitor. He makes me happy. Visitor, she replied. The nurse was indeed puzzled, for she had never noticed any visitor by Jim's bed. The chair was always empty during visiting hours. When does your visitor come? Got to change the page here. When does your visitor come? And he replied, every day, replied Jim, with the light in his eyes growing brighter. Yup, every day at 12 o'clock he comes and he stands at the foot of my bed. I see him there. He smiles at me and says, Jim, it's Jesus. And I'll tell you, I read that and I just began to weep. I felt the presence of God like I hadn't felt in a long time. Going through all the motions, doing everything that I'm to be doing as a Christian, as a minister. But I began to realize that that simple relationship, just coming before the Lord, just saying Jesus is David, and just going from there, just, just communing with him, just relationship with him. Man, I just, I began to weep and I realized and repent and say, Lord, I didn't even realize that it was so, so I had left my first love. Here, I, I preached many times on that church of Ephesus and, and preached on leaving our first love and not even realizing that very subtly that I had left my first love. So folks, I'm just telling you here that it is something that we have to take heed. The Bible says, if you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. If you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. And we have to be very aware of the reality of that, that that can happen to any of us, that we can be guilty of leaving our first love. He loves you. He loved you enough to die for you. And the reason he died for you is so that you could be reconciled, restored back to relationship with him. That is the reason why he died for you. Not just for all the other stuff, all the other benefits. You know, I think of Solomon, the wisest man in the world who experienced all of the things that a human being could experience all of the uh, relationships, all of the power, all of the money, uh, stature. He was a king. I mean, it doesn't get any higher than that in this earth. But at the end of his life, he said this. He said, the whole duty of man is to fear God, which means to maintain relationship with God and keep his commandments. That's, that's what we exist for, is relationship, intimacy. With him. So I just encourage you here 
today that we must be very careful that we don't allow ourselves to enter into that place to where we have forgotten the simplicity of the relationship that we have with the Lord. I want to look at just briefly here a couple. That's that's the main message that I wanted to get across to you here today. But if we were to look in Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah chapter 40, in verse, I'll just begin reading in verse 25. I want to look at a few of the of the benefits of the benefits of those who wait upon the Lord. Those who bind together by twisting and maintain and establish that relationship. The Bible says, To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, and not one failed. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known, and hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Verse 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That idea of renewing your strength is the idea of exchanging your strength. You see, when we bind together by twisting and we enter into intimacy with the Lord and when we're walking closely with Him through faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, what happens then is there is an exchange now of strength. We're no longer living now in the strength of our own ability and the strength of our flesh. There has been an exchange of strength. Now we are living by the strength of the Lord. Amen. He has imparted to us and given us the grace and the strength and the power and the ability now to live the Christian life and to walk in the manner that God has laid out in His Word. Number one benefit for those who wait on the Lord. They shall renew their strength, exchange their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. That is such a powerful illustration, a powerful analogy. You see, eagles have the ability to soar literally above the clouds. They soar above the clouds. So if you can imagine this as it applies to us as Christians, when we wait upon the Lord and we have that exchange of strength, now we are in a place now where we soar above the dark clouds, all right, of whatever that may be, of oppression, of depression, of circumstances, of trials, of whatever it may be that wants to swallow us up and overwhelm us as believers now because we have established that intimacy and we are walking in intimacy and we have exchanged our strength. Now we are soaring above the dark clouds of life. Amen. 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 Trials are going to come, folks. Dark clouds are going to be there. Deep valleys are going to be there in our lives. When I look across this small congregation, I see those who are a bit older and you know what You've been to some places. You've been through some things. You have experienced some things. So you know what I'm talking about. Life is full of heartaches and heartbreaks and deep valleys and heated trials and seasons of suffering. That is a reality. But you see, when we wait upon the Lord, when we wait upon the Lord, and we're walking in intimacy. We're, we're tending to Him. We're ministering to Him. 
We're worshiping Him. We're blessing His name. And there is that exchange of strength. Then the result is, my friend, that you can soar above. Not that they're not there, but you soar above them. And they don't have the effect on you that they would have on anyone else who is not in proper relationship. You know, I've realized something through life that through the experiences that we go through, through the trials and the suffering and, and the situations that we go through, you're either going to get better. In other words, your relationship is going to get better with the Lord. You're going to, you're going to be strengthened and you're going to have more intimacy with Him or you're going to get bitter. Right. One of the two. And I've seen too many, not unsaved people, but saved people who have been through so many fires and through so many seasons of difficulty and suffering that they haven't gotten better. They haven't put that trial or that valley in the hands of the Lord and they didn't develop intimacy when they were in the midst of that valley, when they were in that heated trial. And as a result, they didn't get better in their relationship. They got bitter. And that's too many Christians. I've experienced that myself. And it's very easy to do if we don't put that thing in the hands of the Lord. So when we wait upon the Lord, we now are able to soar above like an eagle. See, eagles, man, they, I don't know if you ever watched or, or have seen uh, uh, an eagle soaring to heights that I mean, it's you almost can't even see them. They're, they're, they soar up. I think of um, that psalm. I believe it's a psalm that talks about the psalm or proverb talks about hinds feet on high places. That those who dwell on the high places, God has called us to dwell on the high places. He's called us to soar like an eagle yes. above the dark clouds of life and not be overwhelmed and overcome by those. So those, these are benefits of those who wait upon the Lord. And then it says, they shall run and not be weary. You see, the seasons in our lives where it's intense and we are constantly moving, we are, uh, whatever, it's just a season that we go through and we're running, if you will. You see, when you're, when you're living in the strength of the Lord, you're not going to grow weary. You're going to be able to go through that season. I, I think back of seasons in my life that were very difficult, very busy, very intense seasons of my life. And I look back and I say, wow, how did I even get through that? How did I even maintain, maintain my sanity and get through that particular season that when I look back on it, it was so difficult and so intense? Well, it was the strength of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. I didn't grow weary because he was giving me his strength. So there's seasons that we go through that we, we run and the promises we won't be weary. And then it says, and we shall walk and not faint. And this is something that I feel the Lord dropped in my heart concerning those two uh, things right there, running and not being weary and walking and not fainting. The walking and not fainting is this. This is the everyday, this is the majority of our lives, the everyday mundane walk that we, uh, things that we do every day. How many of you, you look, you look at your day, you look back and you do just about the same things every day. You know, for me, it's I get up, I stumble out in the kitchen, click on that coffee pot, you know, get my coffee made up, sit down, drink my coffee, you know, have my, have my quiet time, my prayer time. And then as the day goes, that's pretty much, pretty much the same routine. And things when the, the mundaneness of life many times, if we're not careful and we're not doing it out of again, main, and that was part of what I, what I shared with you, the frustration that I had. I was going through all the right motions. I was checking all the boxes. I was having the quiet time. I was reading my Bible. I was drinking my coffee. I was, you know, taking care of my wife. I was doing, taking care of my responsibilities. I was traveling. I was preaching, but there was something missing, and that was that intimacy, that desire to just be with Jesus. Amen? And if we're not careful in those everyday, mundane uh, situations, those times, which really that's almost all of the time, when we are just doing, we're doing what we do. We're doing what we do. Maybe 
and most of you are, or many of you are retired in here, whatever, but when you work, you get up, you go to work for a whatever, eight, 10, 12 hours a day, you come home, you know, you go through basically the same routine. And if you're not careful and you're not uh, living the life out of relationship, you can faint when you're walking and you can get weary when you're running. Bottom line is this, it's all about the relationship, folks. Amen. Right. That's my message. What this thing is all about is all about the relationship. It's not about your joy, not about your peace, <coughs> not about your victory over sin. Yes, those are all a reality when you're in the right relationship. But the bottom line is this, it's all about the relationship. You know, you think about the fact that you can call God your father. Yes, yes, yes. Your father. God, the creator of the universe, gives you the right and the privilege when you received his son to call him. <clears throat> the Bible says that we are adopted into his family. That word adoption in the Greek, it, it, it gives us, it means we have the same rights and privileges as his own born son. As if the blood of God, the blood of Jesus is flowing through our veins. That's how powerful that adoption is. So this thing, my friends, it's all about that relationship. And because he's your father, you have an inheritance. You are an heir with God and a joint heir with the Lord. That's family, folks. That's family. So get in your prayer closet and approach the Lord and say, Jesus, it's whatever your name is. Put your name in. And I just want to have some fellowship. I just want to have fellowship. That's what this is all about. It's not just about you checking off that box in prayer time. I always, I, I somewhat pride myself. I've always prided myself in being pretty diligent when it comes to prayer and I teach on it and I preach on it and on And you could have a prayer life, my friend, and lose intimacy with the Lord. So beware. So beware. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, that you stopped at nothing. You stopped at nothing, Lord, to restore relationship back to you. You stopped at nothing, Lord God, to bring us back into harmony with you, back into friendship with you, that we could walk with you like Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. That's what you desire with your children, Lord. And Father, I just pray that these simple words, Lord God, would challenge the hearts of your people to maintain that intimacy and to maintain that relationship. <coughs> that we may walk with you the way that you have ordained for us to walk with you, Lord. For a great price was paid that we could have restored relationship, that we could be reconciled back to you. And Lord, may we wait upon you as a lifestyle, Lord God. The Father will thank you for it today, giving you the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We worship here for a few minutes. Be sensitive to, to the Lord. And I would just encourage you, just uh, slip up your hands. Maybe the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart. Showing that maybe you have slipped away from that simple relationship and you need to restore that. It's not, God does not hate you, God. He just wants you to get back into that place to where you want more than anything intimacy with Him. You want to wait on the Lord. And God will restore that for you. Y'all go ahead. Yes.
Spirit and most of all the blessings today. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I know this is the talk of all the, the AI and all this kind of stuff and, and, and all this things going on with electronics and across the world. I don't know if you realize that human beings have something that's very unique to human beings. Uh, this makes sense in a little bit. But what's very unique to them is you can be in a crowded room with everybody talking. And you have the ability as a human being to zero in on that little conversation that's in the back of the room. Two people over. And two people. You have the ability to tune everything out. And listen to that. This has been proven. Scientifically proven. You have the ability to tune everything out and listen to just that conversation. I think of a waiter. I think of being a waiter in a restaurant. You're waiting on the Lord. And he's there and you have this whole crowd of people around you. And everybody's talking. And everybody's trying to make noise. People are trying to distract you, or people are just talking. There are other things that, that seem to take precedence. But you, as a child of God, have the ability to focus in on your Father and hear His voice and be able to talk to Him. It's amazing that we can have that fellowship, that relationship, that waiting on God and hear His voice. Know that we are a child of God. <coughs> know that we have that relationship. But there may be a whole bunch of things we always wanted to do. You know, when the little boy was up here talking. You know, it's like there was a whole bunch of things we want to be. We want to be the. You know, I always want to be the hero of the story. I don't know. Does anybody else always want to be the hero of the story? You know, you always you never envision yourself as the villain. You never envision yourself as the poor shopkeeper off to the side or the, just the worker in the story. You know, you're always the hero. You're always that person on top. But sometimes it's the first thing you know that's what's important. And that vision, you know, the, the best way to kill a man's vision is to give him two. Because if you're not focused on the one thing, you need to be dead. You fail both. And the one vision we should have is to listen to God and to hear His voice. And sometimes a vision of being a hero can take us away from that. Even if it's a hero in the church, even if somebody does something great, you know, doing, being the best missionary, being the best evangelist, being the best whatever, worship leader. Being the best preacher, being the best singer, guitar player, you know, that can take you away from the right vision. We have to focus, we have to narrow in with all the things that are happening. Because we're waiting on the Lord with all the things around, with everything out, we have to wait on the Lord. We have to focus in on that one conversation, discussing God.
Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for joining us. I know you were blessed. 